So to, um, xi is an orientation. That means that it's um, plus or minus the wedge product of an orthonormal basis for the approximate tangent space. So that's the notion of uh, uh, integer multiplicity current. And then you define T, if we call this T, then the relevant current is just the current that you get by integrating using the dual pairing between omega and this orientation. And you're integrating over M. And this is for, of course, it's a current, so this has to be well defined for omega in dm. And um, not only does this have to be measurable, remember, for, to make sense out of things like this, you need it to be integrable. So you need that theta integral over m dhn has to be finite. Uh, m intersect w has to be finite for every w, which, for every open w, which is compactly contained in u. So that's the notion of uh, integer multiplicity current. It's exactly like integrating over a smooth manifold. Exactly like it. And the only difference is for if when M is, when you're talking about smooth manifolds, this would be a smooth manifold instead of just a rectifiable set. And this would be a continuous orientation for that smooth manifold. That would be the normal meaning of integrating a form. So indeed, this is a generalization of the notion of integrating forms over a smooth manifold in, in the natural sense. Now, uh, I should uh, point out how you push forward pushing. Uh, if you t let's first of all take the simplest case. When F is M, so F is a map, say, from U into V, so this is open in RP. All of this here is happening in RP. So M is a um, countably re rectifiable set contained in U, and U is open in RP. Usual situation. U is open in RP. So same thing here, but if we think about now mapping into another open set where this could be open in a different Euclidean space, say in RQ. And this is at least, say, C1 to begin with. And let's suppose even that it's one to one as well. And even that it's got rank N at each point. So the induced linear map has got rank N for every X in M, say. So, um, so that's the simplest possible case. Well, then, of course, you know how to define uh, F sharp of tor M theta xi. That would be just the normal way of pushing a, 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 a taking the image of a smooth manifold. So uh, remember, in this case, the image is a smooth manifold because of rank N, and it's one to one. So this would be an embedded Submanifold of this image space, V, that at uh, C1, manifold in V. And uh, the, just the usual definition, it would be, uh, now we'd use the, uh, remember we did this computation. We, you, you use the area form to work out what this is. And you find that it turns out to be exactly theta composite f to the minus 1. So the density naturally is just the density that you started with. So you, to get the density of the image thing, you just take the density at the pre-image point. And uh, you take uh, the, the um, uh, integral over, uh, and then you take the dual pairing, uh, xi um, uh, um, omega. So you pull back. Uh, omega, so it's omega at f of x. Oh, I didn't quite do this right. Yeah. Right, so it's omega 
of uh, the image point f of x. So this is the push forward, so this is the uh, omega is now a form in d, of course. So it's omega at f of x, and then it's the induced orientation. Remember how that worked out? So uh, eta, so this is dHm. And uh, eta was the induced form. It's the uh, form that you get by taking, so uh, 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 eta is dFx, uh, the induced linear map, uh, hitting the, uh, uh, the orientation, psi. And remember, that's plus or minus dFx, hitting tor 1 up to tor n. And uh, that's uh, where we know how to work that out. Remember, the induced linear map of a wedge is just obtained by putting the linear map on each of the product factors. So we do d tor f wedge up to dn f at x. These are all evaluated at x. And then uh, we, we work this out. This is tor 1 up to tor n, the corresponding orthonormal basis that we're using at that point x for the approximate tangent space of m. And then we work that out. That We worked out that this works out to be plus or minus jmfx uh, times some eta, where eta is called the inju and eta is indeed plus or minus eta 1 wedge up to eta n, where eta 1 up to eta n are an orthonormal basis for this guy. Right? We did that computation a couple of weeks back. So we had e to 1, e to n, orthonormal basis. For uh, um, the image manifold at the image point at f of x. So that's the reason you get this expression and this now we're in the image manifold so this becomes wy eta y and this is dhy so that was the computation that we did a couple of weeks ago in the smooth case now in fact um, if you drop the hypothesis that f is one to one then you can still use the area formula uh, as before except that you get various terms depending on uh, you'll get various signs uh, notice we all, we usually choose eta, we use the, choose the plus or minus for eta so that you get a plus sign here. And then if you do that, this is called the induced orientation. That's the standard uh, definition of induced orientation. Induced by the mapping f. But if f is not, to one, not one to one, then you'll get various terms add, adding and subtracting. And uh, you'll find that you can still use this formula. It's just that you've got to break m up into countably many pieces such that on each piece, f is 1 to 1, except for the pieces where the Jacobian map is 0. And they, in any case, give 0 contribution to the result, as we know by the area formula. So uh, if, f is not to one, if f is not 1, 1, You, then you still get a similar formula. You get a modified formula for the push forward. Namely, you get that F sharp tor M theta xi is, is again, it's now. Uh, instead of this, we get uh, something that we can write this way. It's a sum of uh, multiplicities sum over x in uh, the pre-image, f to the minus 1y. We're still integrating the, over the image space, so we're still integrating with respect to y. And it's um, uh, theta, something we'll call sigma x uh, times theta of x. So we get a sum of terms where sigma is equal to plus or minus 1 at each point plus or minus 1, according as J, uh, M, F is positive or negative. So you still get a density function, and then you still have a dual pairing, uh, omega, eta. 
And this time we choose eta, these are still at the point, evaluated at the point y. And this time we choose eta to make sure that we get an absolute value there. So notice this is still an integer, positive integer, or a non-negative integer. And so, we, so the same formula holds with this uh, complication. So the, the, notice that this is indeed, again, uh, an um, integer multiplicity uh, current. In fact, it's the current corresponding to Fm with the orientation eta, the induced orientation, and with this density function, which we call capital N of y. Notice all of this is proved using the area formula. You just use what we proved in the one-to-one -one case, which also involved the area formula, and uh, you'll find that it gives this in the general case, just by breaking the manifold up into pieces where Jm is positive and where Jm is negative. So you can check that. You'll see all the details are in the text. So you get this. And uh, indeed, you see that the image is, again, an integer multiplicity manifold just that you have to be a little careful about what density, what multiplicity function you get. It's given by this formula. Notice that uh, it's always true that uh, n is less than or equal to the sum. x n at y is less than or equal to the sum over all the pre-image points, theta x. And it's equal mod 2. Furthermore, so uh, that's that's a nice fact. So that's what that looks like. And um, again, I'll leave it to you to check the text. That um, it turns out exactly the same formula with more or less the same computation. Actually, um, you just use the C1 approximation theorem and the fact that uh, any rectifiable set can be written as a union of subsets of C1 manifolds. Uh, together with a set of measures zero. So you use those facts and you find that you can apply this result from the smooth case and this same formula namely uh, a claim that the same formula holds star holds with uh, M, M merely countably and rectifiable uh, as long as the integral again is finite locally for every W properly whose closure is, uh, is compact contained in U and uh, for, with F merely Lipschitz. So in other words, it works uh, in this very general situation and you get exactly the same formula, a very nice formula, get a very explicit formula for mapping integer multiplicity currents. Very, very nice thing. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the, I wanted to mention that because it's an important concept. Did I do something? Did I do something? Oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, this is the uh, at omega. It's the current evaluated. So omega is just the form. Omega is the form. So you push forward the current, and that's then a current in the image space. Okay, so I wanted to mention that because it's a very nice formula and rather important for what, uh, in the theory. Okay, now we're going to try to uh, give the main step in the proof of the, uh, of the compactness theorem today. So there's two preliminary lemmas that we need. So let me try to mention those. So a first lemma, I think I mentioned this one before. So U is open in RP, P bigger than or equal to N. And uh, we assume that we've got uh, 
a current, a T in DNU. Remember, that just means it's a general N current. And uh, we assume that it's got finite mass locally, and also that the boundary has got finite mass locally. For every W properly contained in U. Then, uh, and uh, then, the measure, remember this means that T, remember one of our results is using the Reese representation theorem, one of our results is that this one means that you can represent T uh, as an, as in terms of integration, right? So that means that T of omega can be written as the dual pairing of omega together with some unit vector, which we call T arrow usually, against integrated with respect to a measure. And this is a for all regular measure, locally finite. Me for all regular measure on u, and it's a mu t uh, w is finite for every w properly contained in u. So that was one of our results. Now, here notice we're assuming more. We're assuming also that the boundary has got locally finite mass. The claim is then that this measure mu t is automatically absolutely continuous with respect to Hausdorff measure. AC with respect to Hausdorff measure. Hausdorff measure. Hn. In other words, uh, mu t uh, uh, Hn, uh, uh, mu t uh, e equals zero implies Hn, oh, other way around, Hn uh, absolutely continuous with respect to Hausdorff measure, that's right. So Hn e equals zero implies mu t e equals zero. And you see, remember that's. Uh, there's a consequence of that from abstract measure theory, a nice consequence. Namely, that means that this integral can actually be written as a density function times Hausdorff measure, right? It's a very nice general theorem it's called the radon nicotum theorem. So there's the radon nicotum. This can be written as the integral of this function, dual pairing. Uh, of th times theta dHn, where theta is a non-negative uh, Hn measurable function. So that starts to look, you see, like this, except that we don't yet have a rectifiable set. So this is a bit more special still, but at least as far as the measure is concerned, oh, right, I've messed up the measure here. Ho oh, oh. ho. This is theta, is the theta dHn. Okay. So um, it starts to look like this, but it's, uh, this is much more special uh, because m is a, we're integrating over a countably n rectifiable set here, whereas uh, here we're not sure what the density function looks like where it lives. Maybe it lives on a countably n rectifiable set, maybe it doesn't, maybe it lives in a more general set. But anyway, this is, uh, where this is clearly, if you're trying to prove some sort of rectifiability results, this would clearly be a first step in that direction because at least it takes care of the measure and shows you that you've got a, uh, an integral with at least the same sort of measure. So let me give the proof of this. So proof. Okay, uh, right. Um, yes, yeah, so this is an interesting argument and it, it, um, it illustrates just how powerful, I think it illustrates just how powerful the machinery is that we've developed. Even though the machinery that we've developed just seems to have a lot of trivial little bits, 
Somehow when you put them together, it gives you a rather powerful machine. So let's uh, see if we can prove this result for a start. So T is, um, well, T hits a form omega, of course. But remember, a form omega in DNU is, can be written as, you know, in the standard way. You can write it as sum over alpha in I and P of uh, D, uh, omega alpha dx alpha, what we usually do. So this T omega then can be written as uh, T restricted to omega alpha applied to dx alpha. Well, remember this just means, uh, in terms of this integral, this is just a fancy way of saying integral with respect to mu of the dual pairing, omega alpha, and we're still summing, of course, sum over alpha. It's just the dual pairing, dual pairing uh, dx alpha uh, t arrow. So that doesn't really say anything. It's just a change of notation. But now we can think, we can look at this dx alpha. Remember, alpha is j1 up to jn, an n tuple. And uh, th this I and P, uh, uh, this I and P thing means that you've ordered them correctly. So that's going to equal to P. And so let's let P alpha be the orthogonal projection of RP down onto Rn that you get just by selecting these coordinates. In other words, it's the map that takes x1 up to xp to the, to the point that you get by just selecting the coordinates with indices j1 up to jn. So that's an orthogonal projection. And notice that dx alpha is just the pullback of dy. It's maybe better to call these variables y1 up to y, and otherwise it gets a bit confusing. So we'll call, we'll call points in Rn y1 up to y, and so that means the volume form in Rn is dy1 wedge up to dyn. So it's the pullback of that is, is what dx alpha is. So let's use that. Sum over alpha, t restricted to omega alpha, pullback of dy. And, uh, right, and, um, but on the other hand, uh, that's the same as pushing forward the P alpha sharp, same as pushing forward this current, T restricted to omega alpha uh, uh, dy. Uh, uh, pushing forward dx alpha. Pulling back. Remember, that, um, that's how we define push forward. You, when you want to push a current forward, you pull back the form in this formula for T omega. Pull back the form. So we get that. And uh, let me see if I got that right. Um, yeah. In fact, I, I want to leave the... Yeah, sorry. This is not a good idea. This is, I don't want to write it that way. That's just going in circles. What I want to do is write it this way. We push forward this current uh, and evaluate it at dy. That's the same thing by definition. So this is the omega in this case, and this is the current. OK, so we can write it that way. So let's see if we can examine these currents now. These currents, notice, are living downstairs in Rn. And they've got compact support downstairs because each omega alpha has got compact support on U. So when we push them downstairs, we get a function with compact support. So let's see what we can say about these currents. Well, uh, I, let's first of all look at the boundary of this current. So in fact, let's begin by looking at the boundary of this current. So I'm aiming to say something about these currents. I want to understand these currents. But as a first step, I'm going to look at the boundary of that bit. Uh, 
And let's uh, evaluate that current at a point eta. Well, by definition, that means T restricted to omega alpha uh, applied to D eta. And uh, that's the same as um, T of omega alpha times D eta. Of course it is, because restricting to omega alpha is just the same as taking T with the product double omega alpha in front of the in front of the form. So that's by, just by definition of what this restriction symbol means. So we have that. And then we can do a bit of gymnastics with the... This, now this is a scalar function, this is a form. So we can write this as T of D omega alpha times the form eta. But that introduces an error. We get the correct term D eta when we apply d to this bit, but we get an extra term when we apply d to this bit. So we've got to subtract that back off. So this is minus d omega alpha. That's a one form wedged with eta, like so. And uh, then we can start to say something about the, uh, how big this form is. In particular, I want to say it's got finite mass. So let's check that. So the mass in W of T restricted to omega alpha uh, is, is, well, let me, before I do that, let's just take the absolute value first. Absolute value is less than or equal to. Well, it's less than or equal to the mass of T times the soup of that form, right? That's the definition of mass. So less than or equal to the mass in W of T times the soup of that form. That's D omega alpha eta. Oh, yeah. Uh, I did something wrong there. Yes, I see. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't do the obvious thing here. I should have done the obvious thing. This is T of D of a form. Well, that's by definition the boundary of T hitting the form. So that would have been a better way to write. Boundary of T hitting the form, omega alpha eta, and we've still got this term, minus T, D omega alpha wedge eta, like that. So that's a better way to write it. So then let's start again. So the absolute value then is less than or equal to the mass of the boundary times the soup of that form. Soup of that form is uh, omega alpha times theta eta plus uh, the mass of T times the soup of that form. Now, of course, uh, if we agree that mod eta is less than or equal to 1, then this is less than or equal to that, and this is less than or equal to that. So let's agree that we're taking mod eta less than or equal to 1. Have that. That's good. And you see this side is a fixed quantity. We're ta for the moment, we're taking these omega alphas to be fixed. So this is a fixed quantity, which is finite. So we've got soup over mod eta less than or equal to 1 is this finite quantity. So that means this has got finite mass. It's finite. So of course that means that this is finite. Remember, this has got Lipschitz constant less than or equal to 1. It doesn't increase the mass trivially. So this is less than or equal to, so that means that the mass of the boundary, so, so then the mass in W of the boundary of this guy. Remember, this is the guy we're really interested in because we've represented our current T in terms of a sum like this. So what we're really trying to do is to understand these guys, so I should consider the, those. So we should take the boundary of those guys. T restricted to W alpha. Well, the mass of that, of course, well, remember, pushing forward and boundary commute. So this is the same as 
mass of push forward of the boundary of T restricted to omega alpha. And that's less than or equal to, uh, the, as I said, this doesn't increase mass, so that's less than or equal to the mass of this, which we just said is finite. So that's good. That these guys then have boundaries of finite mass. Now, um, the nice one of the nice things about uh, well, I don't know if you remember, it was a couple of lectures ago now when we were proving the constancy theorem. The constancy theorem referred to the case when the boundary was zero, right? It says that in that case, when you're in the top dimension, by the way, that's the setting we're in now. Notice this is the setting where, where we're in the top dimension. We've pushed the current downstairs to Rn. It's an n-dimensional current. So we're talking about an n-dimensional current in Rn. So it's the same setting as the constancy theorem. However, we don't have boundary zero, but I mentioned uh, at the end of the proof of the constancy theorem, I mentioned that if instead of having zero boundary, you merely had a finite boundary, uh, that is a boundary of finite mass, then you can still draw a conclusion from that. You remember that comment? We called it remark star. I said I was going to refer to it later. <laughs> uh, I, I hope you remember that. So, um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> true, true. There have been a few remark stars, but that's an important one. And uh, the remark star uh, following the constancy theorem following the proof of the constancy theorem. The conclusion was that, of course, you can no longer, you can no longer deduce that it's a constant the way you could in the constancy theorem, of course. That would be ridiculous. But what you can, do, uh, what you can conclude is that it's representable by integration against the density function theta. So it implies that P alpha sharp T restricted to omega alpha, that's the current we're talking about here, it implies that that must be equal to the integral. So, the, uh, so you take, we want to say what that does to some form. And remember, we're downstairs, we're in the top dimension. So in this case, the form, a form with compact support would be simply a scalar function times dy, right? We're downstairs. So that's what an n form looks like in Rn just a scalar function times the volume form of Rn. So uh, remember that uh, what we Mark Stark claimed was that this is actually just the integral of A against the density function, which of course depends on these functions W. We mustn't forget that. We mustn't sweep that under the carpet. This function that we get here exists, but it does depend on the omega alphas that we started with up there. So, uh, but then this is just integration with respect to Lebesgue measure. So that's a nice extra conclusion. As a matter of fact, remember the, uh, this was even in BV. It's, all we need at the moment is that it's in L L1, but actually it's a BV function. So this is in L1. In fact, it's even in BV. It's in L1 loc downstairs. Okay, so we get a very explicit picture of what this guy looks like. Now, um, we can make use of that uh, as follows. Um, namely, uh, let's go back to what we're trying to prove here. Um, what we're trying to prove is that uh, if you have a set with Hn measure 0, then mu t is equal to zero also. So let's take such a set. Okay, so let's take such a set. So take E with, this is E contained in U, with Hn E equals zero. Now, um, um, oh, this contained in U. Well, um, we can, um, 
Remember that we can approximate one of our theorems, if you think back to our discussion of measure theory, one of our theorems is that um, uh, if mu t e is positive, we're actually trying to prove it's zero, but if it were positive, then there would a co be a compact subset with mu t k also positive. Remember that was one of our results, that you can approximate measurable sets from inside by, by compact sets, as long as everything's finite. So uh, without loss of generality then, since we're trying to prove that this is zero, without loss of generality we can take uh, E to be compact. So that simplifies things. We don't have to worry about E being a um, a non-compact set, just looking at a compact set is sufficient. If we can prove that mu t of that is zero, then it implies that mu t in general for any such set E would be zero. So that's good. So we can look at a compact set. And then uh, we can um, observe that because we've got this density result, then uh, we see that uh, that in fact this says that P alpha sharp of T restricted to omega, oh, if we look at the measure of this current, the measure of this current, I think that's what I want to do here. If we look at the measure of this current, P alpha sharp T restricted to omega alpha uh, of E, uh, um, of, uh, that, uh, yeah, let's look at the whole measure. So the entire measure uh, is the same at, well, first of all, let's look at the measure of this set. Well, this set would be zero because it would be uh, obtained by integrating over the set E of uh, the projection of the set E, and that's zero. So that would be zero. So that's, that's really the big advantage of what we've proved here. That, we immediately get that, um, oh, sorry, this is supposed to be downstairs, isn't it? We better keep track here. E is a set upstairs, right, in, in U, and we're supposed to be talking about, this is a current, on the other hand, that lives downstairs. So I'm supposed to be talking about the corresponding downstairs set, P alpha of E. But that's zero, because the, the current, this current just is obtained by integration of an L1 function against Lebesgue measure. So take set of measure zero to measure zero. This is, of course, this is trivially measure zero because ln p alpha e, remember p alpha is a projection, so that's less than or equal to hn of e, which is equal to zero. So certainly that's got to be zero. So that tells us that um, uh, uh, the measure, the whole measure, is the same as restricting to the measure to the complement of this set. So restricted to the complement of this set. So that's Rn minus P alpha of E. Same thing, because this is a set of measure zero with respect to that measure. And now we've just got to uh, use the fact that we uh, T is written in terms of these things. So what does that tell us about T? Okay, well, let's see if we can work that out. So mod T omega is less than or equal to, here, here it is, it's this. So that's less than or equal to the sum of the masses of these things. So less than or equal to the sum of the measures uh, yeah, so less than or equal to the mass of um, the sum of the masses, rather, summing over alpha, of uh, um, uh, P sharp, taking the mass of P sharp, P uh, alpha sharp, uh, T restricted to omega alpha, uh, restricted to uh, this guy, Rn minus P alpha. 
Okay, so we certainly have that. Now, uh, notice I don't have to put a W here because this has already got compact support, this current, right? The W alphas have compact support. So this is just the full mass in Rn of that current. Now, notice I can play a game here. I can put the bracket here, um, uh, here, and I'll get, um, uh, if I put the bracket there, then this will become Rp, the pre-image of P alpha. So it will become Rp instead of Rn, which is P, to the P alpha to the minus 1 of Rn is Rp. And this is P alpha to the minus 1 of P alpha E. Now notice the nice thing is that certainly E is contained in P alpha to the minus 1 of P alpha E. In fact, it's a much bigger set in general. So, so that's good. So we have that. And then this is less than or equal to, uh, well, the mass again have t uh, P alpha doesn't increase mass, so I can just erase that. It's got Lipschitz constant less than or equal to 1. So this is less than or equal to the sum over alpha of the mass of the, this current, T restricted to omega alpha, restricted to Rp minus P alpha. To, well, certainly restricted to minus E because of this. I could actually say more. I could leave P alpha to the minus 1, P alpha E there if I wished. And it would be that, but let's, we don't need that. Let's just throw that away and use this inclusion. So we get that. Okay, and then, uh, and that would be uh, T omega, right. So, uh, yeah, so I think we're supposed to be finished here. Uh, let's see. Um, yes, uh, right. Okay, so that, uh, this is true for uh, every omega that we, of this type that we started with. Started with an arbitrary omega, so that tells us the mass of T in W of T, as long as support, so let's agree that always support of omega is, let's look at all omegas now with support contained in a fixed set W, which is properly contained in U. And then take the soup over mod omega less than or equal to 1. Well, that gives us the mass on the left here. And that's less than or equal to, uh, well, this is less than or equal to 1, fortunately, so that's good. That comes out as a constant. So less than or equal to the sum over alpha, uh, which is n that choose p. Remember, the number of indices alpha is, or rather, p choose n. So there are p choose n terms, and each is less than the mass of t, mass over w, of t restricted to r. P minus E, like so. And if you stare at that for a minute, you'll see that's clearly impossible unless E has measure zero with respect to the current, right? Because in terms of, in terms of the measure of the current, this is saying that mu T of W, that's what, how mu T is defined, it's, this is mu t of w by definition. It's less than or equal to p choose n of mu t a w minus e. Well, you see, uh, let's agree so e is compact, right? So let's suppose it's contained in w. No harm in that. So then just take a sequence. You can write e. You can take a sequence of these things. So you can write e equals the intersection of a sequence of WQs, where each WQ is properly contained in U, like so. So you can do that. So then we put a Q here, a Q here, and this could be a decreasing sequence, so W a decreasing sequence. This side, by definition, tends to mu of E, mu T of E. So this implies that mu T of E is equal to zero because this side gives zero. The, uh, this is, um, the in intersection of these is the empty set. And they're all finite, of course. Mu t is a finite measure on compact sets. So this gives mu t equals zero. So that's the argument. Now, 
as with most arguments that look like they're sort of basic and important, you should not merely be satisfied with completing the proof. You should spend a few minutes philosophically examining the proof to see if it actually says anything a little bit more. And uh, this one does. Uh, this one says actually something really important more. We didn't actually use the fact that E had measure zero. All we used was the fact that the projections have Lebesgue measure zero. All the projections have Lebesgue measure zero. So, in fact, we can actually say something quite dramatically better than this. Even though this result in itself is already important, but there's also another important conclusion here that if... Uh, now, you remember that... Um, do you remember the structure theorem when we talked about purely unrectifiable sets? We said the structure theorem guarantees that if you take a, a, a set which is countably a sigma finite, so it can be written as a countable union of sets of finite measure, finite Hausdorff measure, then, uh, and it's purely uh, n unrectifiable, then its projection onto, the, onto almost all n-dimensional subspaces is zero with respect to the Lebesgue measure in those n-dimensional subspaces. Uh, in other words, the thing is sort of invisible from most directions. So, um, so suppose um, E is purely as H HN measurable, of course. We're always talking about measurable sets here. HN measurable, uh, sigma uh, finite, that is countably uh, so... Um, E can be, be written as a union, J equals 1 to infinity of Ej with Hn Ej finite. Remember, that was necessary in order to, uh, as far as the structure theorem was concerned. And uh, let's suppose that E is uh, purely unrectifiable, purely n unrectifiable. Then, uh, the projection uh, uh, onto most directions, because this implies that Q, uh, HN, uh, LN, or HN, of QE equals zero for mo most choices of orthogonal projection. For most choices, except for a set of measure zero of Q. Take orthogonal projections onto an n-dimensional subspace. Most of them give you a null set when you project. Well, the claim here is that this means that mu t of E is equal to zero. And in fact, we've already proved that, really, because we proved that um, all you needed in this proof was that the projections onto the n-dimensional subspaces, coordinate subspaces, are zero. Now, admittedly, we mightn't have that, right? They may be, the coordinate subspaces may just happen to be exceptional, so that you mightn't get zero. But on the other hand, uh, you can always apply the same result to a rotated version of the current, right? You can just compose with an orthogonal transformation. So you still conclude this just the same. So, um, so we actually have already proved this. So that's extremely important. That's one of the key steps in the proof of the rectifiability theorem, which is in turn a key step in the proof of the compactness theorem, which we'll talk about after the break. So let's take a 10-minute break. Yeah, maybe I'll get my water now. <laughs>
Ah, Bobby, have you done? Yeah, I think I'm done. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, let me get some water. Yes. 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 This is sort of the abstract fact. If you have a set yes. in, uh, in space or you have a measure yes. and you put it in space and you say it's uh, every continuous sense, you know, yeah. measure zero, yes. then you'd like to differentiate. Which yes. Part.
uh, one of the last things I'd written there was M W of T uh, of uh, uh, R P minus E. And of course, what I meant was M W of T restricted to R P minus E. Right? You, you'll see that there's a mistake in, in the a typographical error there. Okay, so let's see. So we're, uh, I want to give the main step in the proof of the compactness theorem. And I'll have to leave it to you to fill it to do the rest of the argument. Once you've got this main step, the rest is relatively easy, but it, there's still a bit of machinery that we didn't cover that you would have to look up. Uh, in the uh, uh, in some one or two things that we skipped, but at least we're going to do the main step today in the proof of the compactness theorem. By the way, next week is the last week, uh, and I'm going to devote that last week entirely to the proof of the Allard theorem, Allard regularity theorem. So uh, the main step in the proof of the compactness theorem is called the rectifiability theorem. And uh, that goes as follows. Um, suppose that you've got, it's, it's got hypotheses that start off rather similarly to this. Same hypotheses that both mass of T and mass of the boundary should be finite. So um, usual setup U contained in RP is open and T is a current. Uh, an end current in U and the mass locally, the mass of T and the mass of the boundary should be finite for every W which is closure which is a compact subset of U. But now there's one additional hypothesis. Notice they're the same hypotheses that we made in this lemma that we just proved. But there's one additional hypothesis now and that is that the density, the upper density, the upper n-dimensional density of the measure mu t. Notice again, this is finite mass, so again we do have a measure. In fact, we now know from this lemma that the measure is theta dhn, as a matter of fact. But there's certainly a measure, and you hypothesize that that measure is strictly positive for mu t almost every uh, x in u. So let's do, uh, think a little bit about what that means. This eliminates various very weird pathological cases such as um, instead of t sort of living on a rectifiable set it might live on a whole open set or something like that so its measure is sort of smeared out. So that uh, it's still got finite measure, but only by virtue of the fact that it's got density zero in most places. What we're saying here, this hypothesis that we're making here, guarantees that that is not the case here. That, there's, um, that the density is positive. Remember how this is defined? Let me remind you. This was the limb soup as rho goes down to zero of the ratio mu t of the ball centered at x divided by omega n rho to the n. That, well, of course, the omega n's are relevant here, but put it in for aesthetic reasons anyway. Omega n rho to the n, that should be positive for mu t almost every x. Then, the conclusion in that case is that t looks just like one of these integer multiplicity currents. It's exactly like this except that theta is not necessarily integer. It's just, a positive, it's just positive at each point. Then T equals tor M theta psi for some uh, countably n rectifiable set. M contained in U, and where xi 
does indeed uh, uh, orient the approximate tangent space almost everywhere. So xi is plus or minus tor 1 wedge up to tor n plus or minus that for almost for hn xi at x, for hn almost every x, uh, uh, for uh, mu t almost every x. Oh no, actually hn is the same. It, Makes no difference whether you say mu t almost everywhere now or h t almost every because it's the same now because the measure is a positive function times h n. So for h n almost every x. Likewise, this. This is the same as h n almost everywhere. Same thing because of our lemma. h n almost every x in u, uh, in m. And these tor 1 up to tor n orthonormal basis for the approximate tangent space. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a great theorem. That was, of course, Federer and Fleming's theorem. Wonderful theorem. Incredible breakthrough to realize that this is the case. That if you just simply make the hypothesis that the measures are finite of the boundary in the current, and the density positive, that automatically implies that you've actually got one of these things. But do keep in mind that this is just, um, theta is real value, not integer value. In fact, that's what the rest of the proof is. So the rest of the proof of the compactness theorem involves showing that if you take the weak limit of a sequence of, rect uh, of uh, integer multiplicity things, and the limit is integer multiplicity. So that would be the extra step needed to finish the proof after we've done this. But this is indeed the main step in the proof. OK, so let's see if we can uh, give the proof of this. Um, I've got to remind you of something way back when we were talking about uh, measures, that um, the, the com density comparison theorem, you remember that one? We used it to prove the upper density theorem, which we've used many times since. But the density comparison we haven't used much. Let me remind you how that goes. The density comparison lemma says that if you've got a mu t is a Borel regular measure on a metric space, a metric space, x. Uh, then, um, oh, and uh, you take two sets, A1, they need, need to be measurable sets, actually, though in our case here they're going to be measurable, but in general they didn't have to be. A1, A2 contained in X, and uh, you hypothesize that the upper density of mu restricted to uh, A2 at X is bigger than or equal to t for every x in A1. That was the hypothesis. And then the conclusion was, you can sort of read off the conclusion by sort of thinking of this as being the ratio of something that looks like uh, the measure of mu, because it's see, a ratio like this, something that looks like the measure mu divided by something that's sort of like the Lebesgue measure or n-dimensional Hausdorff measure. So if you if you make a guess, you'd probably guess if it, this applies anything, it should imply that the measure, uh, that the um, t times the Hausdorff n-dimensional measure of A1 should be less than or equal to the new measure of A2. So that was the, that was the result. And uh, in particular, um, the set of x such that theta uh, star n, the upper density, mu x equals infinity. If, if you take that set and call that um, c, call that set c, then notice that this certainly says that mu of c, hn of c must be uh, zero. hn, because you can let t go to infinity in this inequality because you can see this is contained in the set of points where the density is, is bigger than or equal to t for each t, right? So that means you can let t tend to infinity here with fixed a2 and 
and with a1 equals c, and you get that um, uh, hn of c equals 0. So we're going to make use of that. In fact, to avoid confusion, notice that this works in any d. There's no dimension in the metric space. It's just a metric space. There's nothing about n in the space. This doesn't have to be applied in Rn or anything like that. It's just an abstract metric space. And this is the, end, uh, the d dimensional density. Let's use d here. And then this would also be d. OK, so that's, uh, that's an important um, uh, beginning that we can say that. OK. So let's start the proof then. Proof of the rectifiability theorem. OK, so um, how does that go? So um, I'm going to tell you right off the bat what um, I'm going to tell you right off the bat how you get M. M is going to be simply the set of points where this density is strictly positive. That's all. So that's what we're going to have to prove is a rectifiable set, countably rectifiable set. So let M equals a set of X in U such that theta M star mu X is strictly positive. And let mj be the set of x in u such that theta star is bigger than 1 over j. Then, of course, m is equal to the countable union j equals 1 to infinity of mj. And I think I'd better work in a compact set. So let's call this and take an open set w, which is Pro open, properly contained in U, compact, and MJ to be that. So trivially, this is true, right? By definition, if it's positive, then it's bigger than 1 over J for some J, right? So uh, we have that. And now uh, let's observe that if we apply um, this comparison theorem, this comparison theorem with t equals 1 over j, take t equals 1 over j in this comparison theorem, and we take d equals n, then we get hn of uh, mj uh, is less than or equal to j times mu t of, uh, and we take mu equals mu t, of course. we get uh, less than j times uh, mu t of mj. Yep. And that's uh, less than or equal to j times mu t of w, of course, which is some fixed finite number. And um, so each of these mj's has finite n-dimensional Hausdorff measure. So that proves that, see, m is the union of these. So that proves that m is sigma finite. So m equals countable union of sets of finite measure. So that's the first step in the proof. We want to prove that it's, we want to prove that it's rectifiable, but at least we've proved that it's a countable union of sets of finite measure. That's a start. OK. Now, um, right. Uh, right. Now, uh, OK, let's see. Uh, right. Now, um, so what do we have to do to prove that M um, is a, a countably rectifiable. Well, remember, we've got the structure theorem that says that um, uh, all you have to do is prove that uh, you remember any set. One of, one of the things we proved, actually very easy to prove, is that you can always decompose any set M as a disjoint union of a, of a 
countably rectifiable set and a purely unrectifiable set. So all we have to do is prove that that purely unrectifiable set has measure zero, and then we're done. We've got that it's uh, that got that M is countably and rectifiable. Then, so that's what. Let's hypothesise that we do have such a set. So, yep. Yeah. So let's do that. Suppose P contained in M is purely unrectifiable and unrectifiable. Okay. Well, um, but we've already done that. See, that's this. It says that. Um, uh, mu t of e is equal to zero. Mu t of p in this case is equal to zero. So the lemma implies mu t of p is equal to zero. So m is countably rectifiable. So m is countably n rectifiable. <coughs> That's good. So we've made, a, we've made progress. We've got our countably unrectifiable set. That's good. That's good. That's countably rectifiable. Now what's left to prove? Well, uh, we've got to prove that um, the rest of the theorem is, that states that um, really the thing looks like this. Um, no longer integer valued, but we've got our theta, so that we've also got that part of the theorem. So that's good. That's this. Um, so we've already done that bit too. So we've got our theta. We've got our rectifiable set. We've got this bit. We've got this bit. Of course, it's not integer valued, but we've got our theta. So what's left is that we've got to check that there's an orientation where this is plus or minus the wedge of the, an orthonormal basis for the approximate tangent space almost everywhere. So that's what's left to prove. Okay, so let's see, how does that go? Right, um, yeah. So let's start. So I'm going to um, first of all do a little bit of gymnastics with the sets and um, this is reminiscent to what we were doing when we were talking about the approximate tangent space of a rectifiable set. We sh uh, when we were proving that um, uh, the approximate tangent space of a rectifiable set can be uh, um, written as the countable union, so recall, so once it's countably n rectifiable, recall that you can write it as m equals union j equals 0 to infinity of mj, where hn m0 is equal to 0, and each mj is contained in an embedded C1 submanifold, n-dimensional embedded C1 submanifold. And this is a disjoint union. And one of the things we checked, a rather easy argument, uh, using the upper density theorem, was to prove that the approximate tangent space of M almost everywhere in this MJ is equal to the classical tangent space of this C1 submanifold, NJ. And we're going to give an argument similar to that now, except that we're going to be looking at the currents instead of, the, instead of just the sets. So. Um, uh, so what is um, T of omega? Remember, T is our current. T of omega, remember, well, we've proved that we, we proved that uh, we have this. So we can explicitly write down our current now. So T of omega <coughs> equals um, the dual pairing of omega with the orientation xi, which is also usually written as T arrow. Remember, that's a unit vector, but at the moment, that's all we know about it. 
That's a unit, unit n vector. And uh, the theta dhn. So that's what we have. Now, um, then I'm going to uh, do the following. Um, I'm going to start playing around with m. So m union, this is the decomposition we used when we were talking about approximate tangent spaces. I look at m union nj minus mj, so I'm using this notation. Notice that's the same as nj union m minus nj. And on both sides we've got a disjoint union, notice. This is disjoint union and this is a disjoint union. And of course they're trivially equal because both sides are equal to n union m. So, no question. So we can uh, um, write t in terms of these. So this can be written, this is integral over m, sorry. We now know that there's an m. Countable. mj, thanks. mj minus m. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, no, sorry. This this one. <laughs> I'm getting a bit punchy now, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, this is uh, M minus NJ, right? N union M. Because both sides are equal to NJ union M. Oh, NJ union M, yeah, that's right. Oh, this is M minus MJ, right? That's right. So this is MJ. Sorry, now we're right, I think. Did I? No. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's this. Is that what I want to say? I think that's it. That's no, no, actually, that's not what I wanted to say. Wait a minute. Um, NJ minus M. Uh, right. Uh, right, so. No, that's not what I wanted to say, actually. Hold on. So. We did this. Anyone have their notes from that lecture? It was only it was only it was only two months ago. Um, N J minus M. I think this is N J minus M, and this is N N J union M minus N J. Okay, that's at least a correct statement. Now I think it's what we want. So then. T omega then is equal to uh, um, integral, uh, I'm going to rewrite it, I'm going to write it as instead of integral over m, I'm going to write it as integral over nj, yep, of the same stuff, plus the integral uh, of, over this, same stuff, same stuff, minus the integral over this. So, um, so I should make it so t omega of m. t omega is equal to the integral over m, that's its definition, of omega xi theta dhn. Okay, and that's equal to this plus this minus the integral over nj minus m. Omega xi theta dhn. Now, um, take a point xi in, a t consider points x in mj, well, um, and I actually want to consider the push forward of, um, I want to consider the push forward by this. So we're going to use the same notation that we've been using. Eta x lambda y, you get by translating x to the origin and homothetizing by factor lambda to the minus 1. So this is lambda to the minus 1, y minus x. And I want to look at, um, instead of looking just at t omega, I want to look at um, eta uh, x lambda sharp t omega, but remember that's the same as t of the pullback, x lambda sharp omega, and that's equal then that 
that's equal then to this, but with eta, the pullback here, so eta x. So I've got to put the pullback instead of omega, I'm putting the pullback by this map, x lambda sharp omega, dual pairing with xi. Theta dhn, and likewise here, this is the pullback. Eta x lambda sharp omega dual pairing with xi. Same thing with these. Eta x lambda sharp pull back paired with xi. Okay, so we have that. Now uh, this is um, integral over m. Now uh, this bit, it's pretty clear what happens because n is a C1 submanifold, right? And omega is smooth. So we can change the variable in this one. Okay, hope we're done with that. Okay, now this one, as I said, is smooth, so we can change variables. So this one I can write as, um, well, okay, so uh, omega, uh, is, uh, it's omega uh, evaluated eta x lambda y, say, uh, omega alpha, it's the usual form, omega is as usual, sum of omega alpha dx alpha, like that. So it's omega alpha d, dx alpha uh, paired with xi, summed on alpha over nj, and then theta dhn here. And it's theta y, let's call the variable y, theta y, so this is xi at y. Okay, and I'll do the other terms in just a second. These other terms. And this one is, uh, let's see, now, um, clearly I should change variables here. I should let that be the new variable z. Notice this is all happening on a smooth manifold, so it becomes a standard change of variables here. So I'm going to use z equals eta x lambda y. Remember, x and lambda are fixed, y is the variable here. So in other words, that's, uh, uh, we've got to do the algebra. Um, this is a new variable z. So y, the old variable, is uh, x plus lambda times z. So that means we've got uh, integral over nj. Oh, and the new variable, uh, this will be uh, eta x lambda of nj. We've changed the variable, so we're now working on the new on the manifold that you get by applying eta x lambda to nj, and then it's omega alpha evaluated at z, eta x lambda y, which is z, uh, dx alpha, doesn't change, and then xi at um, uh, x plus lambda z. Uh, and then it's theta of x plus lambda z. And then it's dhnz now. And it's st still these other terms. OK. Now, notice that you can see this is completely classical now because n's a C1 submanifold. So you can see what's happening. This clearly converges to xi at x almost everywhere. This one certainly converges to theta at x almost everywhere. This converges to the classical tangent space in the L1 sense almost everywhere. So this whole thing converges to the integral over the classical tangent space of nj uh, uh, omega alpha z uh, paired with, uh, times dx alpha paired with uh, uh, xi at x, which is a constant, and times theta of x, which is a constant. So these are constants. They're no longer part of the integration. 
So they're both constants, and then we've got dHnz plus these other terms. Now let's get rid of these other terms right away. Uh, this is exactly reminiscent of the argument I referred to a few minutes ago when we were talking about uh, the fact that the approximate tangent space of M is, is the same for almost every X in MJ as the classical tangent space of NJ. Uh, that involves showing that these terms tend to zero. And that's very easy to check that just using the upper density theorem exactly in the way that we did when we were talking about those approximate tangent space. So these guys tend to zero by the upper density theorem. Notice we've certainly got mileage out of the upper density theorem. We've used it maybe a dozen times in different places. It's really a very valuable theorem. OK, so these are zero now. So we just get this. And uh, so that's what we get. And this is uh, now a smooth form still on the same form as before. We're still summing on alpha. But now we've got these constants. And uh, the theta can come out the front. We can't quite pull the xi out the front because we're pairing it with this. But well, I can pull the theta out the front. That's fine. And that's for uh, hn almost every x in m in mj. mj is the relevant part of m here, because we're talking about nj. So you, uh, these tend to zero for hn almost every x in mj. Not in m, but in mj, because we're talking, we're using nj as our base manifold here. OK, so we get that. Now let's see. Um, uh, one point, so we can now say what the boundary is, then the boundary of t at omega, then, is just equal to this same stuff, but with a, a d a differential of this, so it's the integral over the approximate tangent space of nj, sum over alpha, d omega alpha at z, wedged with dx alpha, paired with the constant n vector psi. And that's dh n of z. So that's the boundary. Now, I claim that the boundary, on the other hand, is 0 for almost every x. Let's check that. So um, yes, so uh, right. I always seem to get this bit. Messed up. So, uh, yeah, so the claim is I think we can get rid of this now. Claim boundary of T equals zero, uh, boundary of uh, yeah, T is equal to zero for, uh, yeah, so what did I do here? Um, I, um, this, this is rubbish. Um, uh, this is supposed to be the pullback, right? So this is eta x lambda sharp. Uh, yeah, that's right, omega. Claim is that that tends to zero. tends to zero for hn almost every x in mj. And if that's the case, that would be good here, because we, this, is, this is equal to this. So we'd get that this integral is zero, which looks promising if we know this is zero. So we, I claim that's zero. Now let's see if we can check that. Um, yeah. Uh, right. So take uh, omega with support, suppose to support omega, just for argument's sake, suppose support omega is contained in a ball. Remember, omega's got compact support, so let's suppose it's in some particular ball, which we call dr. And then observe that um, this is notice as the push forward of boundary t. So eta x lambda sharp of boundary t, uh, omega, uh, well, you can work that out, that's uh, 
certainly less than, or, I mean, this is an integral, right? It's e equal to the integral of um, the uh, uh, eta x, yeah, um, uh, yeah, it's eta x lambda sharp, uh, uh, pullback rather, omega, uh, uh, boundary t omega, remember, for some tangent direction, this is the integral, and then it's the mu boundary t. That's just a general fact, and nothing special about the boundary current. It's just generally like that. And um, using that, you can prove this is trivially, take absolute values, this is trivially less than or equal. Now, we've got to be careful here. Omega is an n minus 1 form, because we're talking about boundary here, right? So it's an n minus 1 form. So that means that, remember, e, this eta is a homothetic by lambda to the minus 1. So you get a factor lambda to the 1 minus n from here. So it's less than or equal to lambda to the 1 minus n times the measure of what's left. This has a length 1 by definition, so it's the measure of boundary of t, and where's this living? Well, of course, it's living in the ball of radius lambda r centered at x, because we're pushing forward by the current e direct lambda, which takes the ball of radius r centered at 0 to the ball of radius lambda times r centered at x. So we get that. And then we use our density theorem again. Oh, unfortunately, I was too premature. I erased that. But our density theorem with d equals n tells us that this tends to 0 by the by the comparison theorem. By that abstract comparison theorem in metric space. So this tends to zero. In fact, again, we use that comparison theorem with d equals n. So that tends to zero. So that means, indeed, this is actually equal to zero, this thing with this constant xi and theta x. So that, we should be able to do something with that. So, by the way, and, and when I first saw this, I thought, I had the feeling that there was something wrong. It looked like somehow one was cheating somehow. That, uh, you, how could you use the the uh, density, the comparison theorem with d equals n when you're talking about an n minus 1 dimensional thing. But that's one of the beauties of the comparison theorem. It's abstract in metric space. There is no n. It's whatever you define it to be. It's, um, so um, you check, you'll find, it, you, you'll find the details in the text. Indeed, indeed, this is a correct application of the comparison theorem. So. Um, so that, this guy is zero. So we can forget the theta x, it's this that's zero. So it's, that is, integral over the tangent space, which is an n-dimensional n subspace, of uh, sum over alpha of omega alpha uh, z dx alpha dhn equals zero, this is, z is the variable of integration, dhn z equals zero for every omega equals sum omega alpha dx alpha, which is a n form of complex support in u. So that's what we have. Oh, this is now for every uh, n form with complex support in rp. Notice u got blown away because we passed the limit here. Whole businesses, all happening. What's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, this is sum dx alpha xi x, and that's what we don't know about yet. Okay, now let's see. Well, it's the usual thing. If you're confronted with an identity like this, then obviously you should start making some special choices of W alpha to see if you can glean any information about what this constant has to look like. So uh, if you think about it for a while, so certainly without loss of generality, we can assume that Tx nj is just Rn cross zero, right? No problem, just rotate everything. So 
we can assume that Tx nj is equal to Rn cross 0. Okay, that's no problem. And um, so this becomes Rn cross 0. That n dimensional subspace. And then we've just got to guess some good choices. So I'm going to forget the sum, I'm just going to choose one of them. I'm going to take any j bigger than or equal to n plus 1 and any function zeta which is C infinity with compact support on Rp and any indices I1, In uh, between uh, 1 and P. Any indices at all, there are n minus 1 of these. I want a total of n indices. So I've got 1 index j and these and I'm going to take omega alpha uh, omega to be simply um, no longer a sum, it's just going to be, have one term in it. It's going to be omega at z is going to be zeta at z times uh, yj times e uh, i1 wedge up to e i n minus 1. So it's a constant n minus 1 vector times the jth coordinate function Oh, sorry, zj, Z, uh, coordinates of z here, zj. This is for z in rp. Coordinates are in rp. Okay, and... Um, uh, yeah, what is that now? Uh, uh, well, this is an n minus 1 form. Yeah, it's an n minus 1 form at the moment. And remember, oh, sorry, um, I forgot. Well, this is not zero, it's, yeah, you're right, it's d. It's the boundary that's zero, right? So d omega alpha at z wedge with that. That's the thing that's zero. The boundary was zero, not the thing. So that's zero. The last Which one are we? Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot. Right, yeah, it's the wrong animal, right? Right, it's a dog instead of a cat, right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But... Thanks. Xi minus one. Okay, so then uh, that's our n minus one form. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake up here. Remember, we're talking about the boundary being zero, not the current. So that it's d of this wedged with dx alpha that's zero. And now let's take d of this, d omega of this. Well, we're supposed to take d of this bit, but you see zj is identically zero on Rn cross zero because j is bigger than or equal to n plus one. So this form is identically zero on Rn cross zero. So you don't have to worry about differentiating d z to you'll get zero from that term. It's identically zero. The only thing you have to worry about is taking z to z times d z j wedge d x i 1 up to d x i n minus 1, like that. So that's what's zero. So let's plug it in and see what that says. That is z to z times d z j wedge with dx i1 wedge up to dx i n minus 1 paired with xi x, which is a constant n vector, integrates to give 0. And by the way, hn now is just uh, a vague measure because we're integrating over rn now, so this is just the integral with respect to a vague measure. So. I don't know why I keep dropping chalk. <laughs> it's really a bit worrying. Maybe, maybe I've had a stroke or something. I'm not sure. Uh, strange. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, th that's what we have. And now we can read it off. Um, this is zero unless. Uh, j i1 up to j uh, n minus 1 are uh, 
oh yeah, um, what did I say about J? I think I said it was bigger than e to n plus 1. <laughs> that wouldn't be so great. Um, bigger than or equal to, oh yeah, bigger than or equal to n plus 1. So it's always 0 when it's bigger than or equal to n plus 1. But then you try j equals n, the same computation. Let's see, somehow got something messed up here. Oh, no, that's OK. Uh, j, n. Uh, right. No, no, that's OK. So this says, yeah, I see. You just got to look at this carefully. Um, this says that whenever one of the indices is bigger than or equal to n plus 1, then you always get 0. But with an arbitrary zeta, so of course that implies, since zeta is arbitrary, that implies this actually is pointwise zero, this pairing. So that implies that dzj wedge dxi1 wedge dxi n minus 1 paired with xi x is equal to zero whenever. Uh, one index in this group is bigger than or equal to n pl plus 1. In other words, the only way you can possibly get a non-zero result is to have exactly the indices 1 up to n, right? So that means that that is Zaya's orthogonal, or the dual element, Let's call the dual element xi star. Xi is orthogonal to, remember, xi is a k vector, so it's the sum uh, uh, c alpha times e alpha, right? It's like that. And this says that all of these terms have to be zero. It's just c1 times e1 wedge up to e n. That's what it is. It's the only possibility. And also C1 has to be plus or minus 1 because it's a unit vector, length 1. It's the orienting vector for the current. It's the T arrow vector, which by definition is length 1. So that, that's it. Uh, this xi x must be orienting the, the space Rn cross 0. Of course, in general, if you go back and not use an orthogonal transformation, that says that xi orients the the tangent space. But remember, this is the same as the tangent, approximate tangent space of M for almost every x in Mj. So that, that's it. That's the end of the proof. OK, got through that with one minute to spare. Okay. So next week, we'll just talk about the Allard theorem. I'm not sure I'll be able to give the complete proof in that time, but I'll certainly be able to give most of the details of the proof in that time. Yeah. What's that? Uh, where is that now? Oh, E n minus one. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, you're right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can't, can't slip anything by you. That's really great, isn't it? Federer and Fleming, I tell you. Those guys were smart. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Right, right. You graduated a year after me at Dr. Brown. Hmm. But you, you went into uh, eventually statistical and genetics yeah. and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's just very weird because we got to know each other because the daughters were in the right. Coast right. together or something. We just, Did he give you any insight about the relationship between Fleming and Federer? No. In fact, even at, even at the uh, memorial thing for Federer, you know, I talked to Wendell a little bit yeah. about things. And then 
And you know, I, there was there was one sort of critical point yes. in history, yes. which everybody you know everybody in the subject talked about now. Graduate students, yes, yeah, yeah.